Thank you for tuning in to Reminders for Living Lucid. So today I want to take a more playful approach to getting into this podcast. So like I mentioned in the intro, I have some pretty heady, kind of heavy topics to get into and uh, some pretty vast belief systems to explore. Um, Real quick preview, if you're familiar with non-duality, Spoiler alert, that's pretty much what I'm going to be getting into in the long term. But I want to allow this to be a gradual exploration. I don't want to get on here and get too too much too soon. As I mentioned, I'm really not intending for this to be educational. So it is an exploration of reminding ourselves what we want to be, who we want to be what we want to be walking into, how we want to be feeling. So how do you want to be feeling? How do you want to be in your life? Who do you want to be? Um, do you trust what you want to be? Do you trust who you want to be? And so that's what I want to explore today. I want to talk about the importance of self-trust. And so I think I want to start this by mentioning something that I actually forgot to mention in the first episode. So I was mentioning social media and how how insidious, I like using that word for that because it feels really appropriate, how insidious social media has become, you know, that it's it's in our pockets and it's in our it's in our habits daily, many, many times a day, even if you're not on social media at all. You probably get on YouTube. You probably interact with the internet at some point. Um, It's hard not to now. So one of the big components of that reality for us right now is this like epidemic of isolation. And that's been like super, super amplified with the pandemic, of course, for obvious reasons. And it's not new. It definitely was gradually... In that, in that realm before the pandemic, before 2020, there was definitely a lot of isolation. And I think a lot of that has to do with how we rely on social media for our communications and connections. And there's this sense, there's this sense that we are connecting. And we are in a certain sense, but it's mental, like it's, it's digital connection. Yeah, nothing inherently wrong with that. But the way that we've been engaging in that feels like it's it's this fake sense of scratching an itch but we are physical biological beings you know we need to connect with people in deep emotional ways to feel fulfilled to feel a part of a community in a satisfying way um so i want to talk about isolation versus solitude it is really important to take time to ourselves when it's in balance, right? And there's there's conversation about introversion versus extroversion. And, you know, that sounds probably too simple to be true. But there are definitely, uh, you know, it's a yin-yang sort of dynamic here. And I've, for most of my life, for most of my life, I've fallen more into the introverted space. And the best definitions I've heard of those is the idea that it's not that you don't like being around people if you're an introvert. It's just that you charge, you recharge in your alone time. And as an extrovert, you recharge around other people. And that that makes a lot of sense to me. And again, I'm sure it's a spectrum and it's not necessarily a neat and tidy, you know, black and white type of uh, situation here. Um, I, like I said, have identified as an introvert for most of my life. And when we were more or less forced to be in isolation for a few months and in my city, I know longer in other cities and other states, and I know a lot longer in other countries, uh, referring to the lockdowns here. Um, Yeah, I definitely realized that like, okay, yeah, I may have a comfort zone 
of being alone, but I definitely need to be around other people to feel fully myself. Um, so, so why is that? I think that there's something to be dis discovered and explored in solitude, um, which is to say, I believe that it's really important or, or fruitful for us to be sure that we're in alignment with our true self, with where our soul desires are, where our, our real interests and real authentic focus lies. I think it's really easy to get impressed and influenced by other people that we surround ourselves with. I mean, what do they say that you're like a, you're a summary of the five people that you spend the most time with, right? I think that is pretty true. We're such social creatures and part of what makes us human is our ability to adapt. And so we adapt to the tribe. We, we reflect back what's being reflected at us. And it's this, it's this dance that goes on and on. And I think that we can dance more. Um, the only word that's coming is efficiently, but that seems like a pretty silly word to attach to dance. Oh yeah, dance really efficiently. Um, but I think that we can bring more to the table, more to the dance floor, if we um, are are already like grounded in our own sense of self, and we. We know who we are. We know where we're going, what, what our focus is, what our passions are, all that sort of thing. And I think from that space, we can learn from other people. We can start to see other people as healthy mirrors reflecting back to us the parts of ourselves that we haven't had the time or space or impetus to, to really face and digest um, the more shadow aspects of self. Um, that's a that's a huge topic we'll definitely get into, just shadow work in general, um, shadow play, all that sort of thing. So that's what healthy solitude looks like. But what about the unhealthy isolation? You probably have a sense of what that looks like for you. Um, I think we've all experienced that to at least a degree or another. Um, but in terms of the way that we still attempt to connect with the collective through the internet, social media, and stuff like that, it's clear to see that these algorithms really set up like echo chambers. You know, you present to Facebook or whatever it may be, you, you present what your interests are based on how much time you spend on a post, based on how you engage with it, all these sorts of things. And as is pretty thoroughly expressed in the documentary The Social Dilemma on Netflix, which I highly recommend checking out if you haven't already. Uh, they talk about how, you know, these, these engines are built to be, um, like most things in the capitalist commercial space, they're intended to be um, addictive, essentially. I was trying to think of a more polite or nuanced way of saying that, but that is essentially how they're built. Um, you know, so it, it, it wants to give you what you've shown that you want to see. And a very interesting bit of information from that documentary was saying that six to one information on social media, six to one is misinformation to accurate information. So there's a lot of just stories going on around the world. And a lot of those stories, especially in mass media, you know, big, big corporate media or just um, mainstream media, what a lot of people are seeing are uh, fear mongering bits of information. And why is that? Why, why is there so much fear out there right now? I think when we're in a state of fear that we are more easily controllable, we, we give up our power and I don't feel called to get into why anyone or anything would want us to give up our power, but I think it's just a natural 
corollary or offshoot of this energy that we've been focusing on as a collective. I'm talking the way that we run our economy, the way that we have convinced ourselves that we live in a context of scarcity and that there isn't enough to go around. I think that's simply not true. I think that we, that abundance is the natural state. And if you look at every other animal species out there, they live in abundance. They live in a situation where what they need is provided. Yeah, they might have to work to get it. You know, yeah, there's carnage and, you know, killing other animals and sacrificing other species for their survival. Yeah, that's part of the dance of nature for sure. And that's kind of ugly. That's especially the way we've uh, isolated ourselves from the natural world and our community. We're not used to that anymore. We're not used to seeing our food being killed, but we are largely still used to benefiting from those from reaping the rewards of that violent and arguably necessary aspect of survival. Point being, we have convinced ourselves that we don't have enough to go around, but you know, when we were wandering the earth thousands of years ago, we could find everything that we needed. And perhaps we've grown to a situation where we wouldn't be able to do that anymore. We wouldn't be able to hunt and gather uh, in an abundant flow to the same capacity that we did when, when the human species wasn't so large. But um, I think that there are creative solutions for these things. And not to get too far down the uh, topic, but it's pretty clear to see that if we wanted to end starvation we we do have the means for that we throw away so much food every single day at least in the united states and um there's an abundance of resources i mean if you just look at the billions and billions of dollars that are going around ceos uh bank accounts you know that's it's honestly an infathomable infathomable amount of money and the things that could be the infrastructures that could be built and sustained with that type of energy is really remarkable and the fact that we're not doing that says a lot about what we believe and what we prioritize and anyway reeling it back from that one we'll get more into that later uh my point is that <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to get wrapped up in the doomsday stories that are going on around the internet right now because that it, it gets people interested, you know, that that evokes the fight or flight, you know, primal mechanisms in our brain of survival. And when we feel there's any sort of threat, we we probably are gonna give it energy. So I want to talk about why it's so important for us to ground ourselves into our own stories right now, and to ground ourselves not just into our own stories, but ground ourselves into our own self-trust, to trust our path. Um, you know, that, that is groundedness. Trust is groundedness. And I think it could be argued that some people are grounded into stories that are not so trustful. Um, you know, anxiety is rampant right now, and and worse, you know, despair is rampant right now, and depression, and people being ungrounded. I mean, I I definitely experience that a lot, you know, just being more in my thoughts, more spacey, and more tuned into the stories that aren't actually in my physical environment, which brings me to a really beautiful quote from Jack Cornfield that I came across at some point recently. Tend to the part of the garden that you can touch. I think that is some deep wisdom, you know, and it's it's so counterintuitive to today's world where we have access to so much information out there via our phones and the internet. You know, we can tap into people's stories and that seems cool. It seems like we're connecting with people all over and it is cool and there is something to be said for it. But it's when we when we attach our emotion 
to stories and realities that are not in our immediate jurisdiction of influence, then that's where we become and start to feel disempowered. And that's the opposite of where we need to be. That's the opposite of what I want to be tapping into and reminding myself and you of. I want to be reminding us of our own empowerment and that we we do have the power, that we do have the abundance and the resources and the energy and the love and the truth and the trust. We have all those things. It's just about tuning into them. And so, you know, I guess I ask you, like, do you have a, a grounded sense of trust in yourself? Are you wavering at all? I waver. I mean, I had a really intense this past, intense week this past week, and some of it was really me orienting into my own um, path and casting out some anxieties and some um, competing timelines, you know, when I say timeline, I just mean, you know, uh, like if you think of like alternative paths that you could take, you know, alternative realities and stuff. I think we're always picking a timeline based on the choices that we're making. And yeah, our lives could look any number of ways, but it's so ungrounding and uh, anxiety provoking to get caught up in what could be, what should be even. And what would have been if we had taken other actions. I don't think that's important. I think what's important is feeling grounded and to trusting that what we get ourselves into is what we need to get ourselves into. And eventually we can make enough mistakes or fail enough times to know what we really want. To to reorient ourselves on the path that we really feel good about being on. And it's never too late to change our paths or to um, ground ourselves into that reflection and into that into that trust. And I know trust is a big word and uh, or it's a big energy is what I mean to say is that it's uh, it's easy to talk about, maybe not as easy to tune into. And there are different avenues to it. Um, you know, what some people call faith is probably what I call trust. But to me, trust feels stronger. Trust feels grounded in to experience. Whereas faith sort of has a connotation that we're, we're um, you know, that leap of faith that, uh, that we're sort of like going out on a limb. Like we, we're choosing to have faith in something that we c- can't prove or that we maybe don't have direct experience in, but we're choosing to believe it. But to me, that's what faith sort of connotates. And um, I'm sure that some people relate to faith in the way that I relate to trust, but I choose to use that word because it, because what I've said, it feels like it's a stronger, more grounded word. Um, and I've had, you know, experiences that have really grounded me into that trust. And I'm extremely grateful for that because I didn't have that for most of my childhood and adolescence. And so, you know, I don't know what that path to to really grounding into trust looks like for everyone. If you have a story of that or or if you're still struggling to find that, I would love to hear about that. So definitely drop a comment or, or hit me up directly and I would love to talk about that because it's a, it's a very integral energy for, for my perspective on life. I think that's vital to have that trust. Especially now, like I said, in this sort of era where where fear is just rampant and there's so many stories, there's so many things that people are trying to get us to be afraid of. And if we can just learn to be these Zen ninjas and just deflect all of the temptations of fear, I think that that's going to be such an important skill to practice. So I would like to guide us through a little mental exercise to... To experience a journey back to the source of self. Um, So if you have the time and space right now, I invite you to maybe close your eyes. Maybe get yourself into a relaxed sort of meditative posture. You know, straight back is always, always good for nice, clear energy flow. Um, If you want to lay down. Even if you're 
going for a walk or something like that, you don't have to close your eyes, but if you want to just tune into this, tune into this energy and journey that I'm going to talk us through now. So let's just start by taking a few deep breaths. Just to come back to the body, to come back to the self. It's good to play in the mind, in the mental realm, and to explore these fun ideas of what it means to be human and to orient ourselves more deeply into the moment through that type of intellectual pursuit and attention. But ultimately, it is enough. It is enough to just be here in our body, to be here in this moment. So let's just continue to breathe consciously. And gratefully to tune into that energy of appreciation of this moment. To recognize that anything that we perceive as being wrong is truly just our perception that might be rooted in something real for you. And I'm not belittling that, but just to put it on pause, to trust that it will resolve in, in due time. So I want us to explore the idea of who we are. So if I ask you, who are you? You may immediately respond with your name. You may say, okay, well, I'll, I'll do this process with myself. Okay, I'm Sean. Okay, well, who's Sean? And I may say, well, Sean is, and I might give you my occupation, I might tell you what I do, what I'm into, the things that excite me and ignite me. I may say where I'm from, who I came from, mention my family, my parents, my grandparents, my city. Like, okay, well, that's what you do, that's where you're from, that's your family, but like, who are you? So you take it further and you think, okay, well, I am an expression of DNA that has been passed through my parents, from their parents, from their parents, from their parents. And you go farther along and you realize how many people in a relatively short amount of generations, how many people were involved in you becoming you. It's like, whoa, that's kind of humbling. And then you think of all the people in the world, and when you go back far enough, it's like, wow, I'm connected to a lot of people, arguably connected to every single person. Okay, well, still, who are you? Are you the DNA? Are you the expression? You take it back further and maybe you go down this story of evolution. Think, well, we are the offspring of, of animals that have come before us, of life forms that have evolved before us. Take it back further and further and further. An expression of a single-celled organism. Who is that? What is that? What is that contingent upon? Think of the basic elements. The water, the air. The oxygen present in water. The hydrogen present in air. How these elements are dancing infinitely together forming different forms of awareness, different contents. 
to be aware of, to be aware through. So we back it all the way up to the Big Bang, right? When all of these components, these elemental basic building blocks of our physical reality are supposedly birthed and out of one moment of singular isness into this vast complex universe. So are we the energy? Are we the space that allows the energy to dance? Are we the witnessing awareness that is present through this whole process? And when you take into account quantum physics, which says that the building blocks of physical reality, that even those aren't physical, that's not a finite fundamental building block. There's, there's more to the story of the atom. There are subatomic particles. There are quirks and all these tiny bits of information and energy. And that it's mostly empty space. It's light dancing as potentialities. There's nothing really solid here. And yet, we're experiencing this physical existence. But where are we experiencing it? From what are we witnessing the experience? As far as I can tell, the only ground of being that we can rely upon is awareness. Pure, unadulterated, unimpeded, pure, conscious awareness. Awareness that is behind your mind, it's behind your eyes, that's listening to your thoughts, that's watching your perceptions, that is present to your perceptions, present to your whole temporary life, your whole momentary expression of DNA that you may pass along to another generation of humans. And they'll go through the same trip, the same experience of going from being a fresh divine vessel of flesh as an infant baby that doesn't know its name it doesn't know what the economy is or what the environment is. It doesn't know that if, if it has brothers and sisters or not, if it has uncles and aunts, it doesn't know any of that. It doesn't know its city or what it likes to do. It's just this feeling, expressive ball of energy, of creativity, of DNA manifest into a person, a new person that's born into this context. And we give it a name. We tell it that it has a gender. We tell it that it has a family, parents, that all these things have names. We start to teach it words, language, and now this new human has tools, symbolic tools of orienting itself into this context of a reality. So now it knows the symbol of its name. I am name. I am Sean. I am 
that which I am. And so it carries off this story. And there's a personality that's involved with this, that it has learned to reject some things. It has learned to be compelled by and interested in certain things. And of course, there's biological roots to this. Certain elements that love to dance with each other, certain elements that love to repel each other. And eventually it goes through the process of conditioning and of growing into an adult, mature human with the capacity of having this self-reflection, this capacity to question those conditionings, to question what's behind all of that. We may come to find out that the same witness is present to its conglomeration of thoughts and feelings. And it may through this process, realize that every other person, every other animal and plant and planet and energy is all stemming from a central source. It's a mystery. We don't know exactly what it is or how it can come to be. But we can acknowledge our connection to this our connection to this moment unfolding in numerous ways, in numerous expressions, and that those expressions may seem separate. It may seem like individual, separate vantage points, but they are connected. <clears throat> they are all connected to the same being this moment simply being and so I invite you back into your body back into your mind back into your heart back into yourself and I can't speak for you but for me going through that process reminds me that we are all connected. And not in a scary way, but in a liberating way. Not in this homogenized, we're all the same. I'm not special. I don't have any role to play here. But in a exciting understanding that we all have a role to play here. That we each represent a cell within a body. Each cell has a purpose and a role and a function. And so I'm feeling pretty far out from that exercise. So I don't think I have too much else to say in this episode. But thank you for tuning in and for being present. And I trust that this exercise can show you whatever it is that you want to see right now. And if you enjoyed it, you can always come back to it. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you want to have a conversation on this podcast, definitely let me know. Leave a comment. Hit me up directly. We're probably already friends. And if not, let's be friends. All right. Thank you. I look forward to future reminders. Mm -hmm.